the morning for another five minutes. But um, good morning, almost good afternoon. And I'm glad to have everybody joining us here for um, our, our hunch launch. And um, just to kind of get started, I want to introduce myself. My name is Libby Wentz. Um, I'm the principal investigator for the Knowledge Exchange for Resilience, which is an initiative um, out of Arizona State University. I'm also a professor of geography, and I'm also the vice provost and dean of the Graduate College. So I'm interested in many aspects of, of ASU and higher education and research. Um, and I wanted to kind of, before I kind of explain sort of the format of the Hunch Lounge and why all of you are here, um, I want to actually make sure I thank some of the people who helped make this, um, this particular um, program possible. So as you can tell by where we are, this was a partnership between um, SRP for uh, the venue, and I noticed the uh, uh, napkins are um, ASU branded colors, which is awesome. Um, a partnership between SRP and um, ASU. Um, from SRP, uh, Christy Boos, who's here, um, made a significant difference in helping getting this going, along with um, Hank Courtright, who was unable to be here today, um, Mark Campbell, who's here, um, Mike Hummel, uh, Kelly Barr, and John Hackman. So really grateful to the SRP people who helped make this possible, as well as the people who helped um, prepare the food and make sure that this facility was ready for us. Um, from the Knowledge Exchange for Resilience, I want to thank um, and, and ASU, Gary Dirks, uh, Christina Hernandez, Abby Johnson, Carlos Aguilar, Susie Bustillos, Giovanni Arenas, Chelsea Dixon, and Patricia Solis. Uh, for their, you know, getting in touch with the speakers, putting together the program, and making sure that all of this was going to run smoothly. So thank you. Join me thanking all of them for making this possible. <laughs> Let me talk for just one minute about the, um, the, the Knowledge Exchange for Resilience. So all of you know that, um, you know, advancing in life is about two things. It's about what you know and it's about who you know. Um, who you know, your social network in terms of who helps you, you know, get jobs, learn about opportunities. That social network that all of us depend on um, is really vitally important. And it also is the basis for what you know. Think about consumer reports and all sorts of places that you go for data to try to advance your knowledge about a particular problem that you're trying to solve. The um, activities of the Knowledge Exchange for Resilience are aimed at building community resilience here in Maricopa County and using that model to expand community resilience um, nationally and worldwide. And we use that same basis, what you know and who you know, uh, to build community resilience. So the what you know comes uh, from data sharing. Uh, so if you do have a chance to go on our website, we have been curating and compiling um, many different data sets and building data dashboards, some of the people who have helped build those are here in the today, uh, so I'm really grateful for the work that they are doing. Um, as well as around our social networks. And social networks are built around very loose ties, people that you um, meet at a, an event like today, as well as deep ties, ones that you have long-term uh, relationships with going on. And so what we're trying to do today is actually continue to sort of break down the silos between different organizations uh, by having people who might not have met one another before but are interested in some of the same problems um, get together, meet, talk, um, and explore some of the different challenges. And so that's the purpose of the Hunch Lunch which is to bring people together who are interested in the same topic, have them talk about the topic at a very light level um, through our lightning talks to share their hunches. Like, here's what I know, what's going on in my particular sector. Let me share that with you. Um, and then we follow that up with um, sort of at table um, conversations about how can we share our knowledge and move things forward um, in, a, in, a, in a cohesive way. Um, you know, some of the follow-ups and some of the impacts come just within weeks of these kinds of events, and some of them take even years to establish, but we've seen fantastic outcomes um, in, in other areas. The Knowledge Exchange for Resilience is primarily driven by um, 
our understanding of, of heat and heat resilience because that's one of the biggest environmental challenges of uh, Maricopa County. Um, that led me to the partnership with SRP with respect to um, electricity and energy usage, which is why I've been part of the ASU SRP steering committee um, for the last couple of years, along with a couple of other people who are um, also in this room. And as part of those conversations, we started to talk about the importance of electrification um, and uh, transportation electrification and the role that SRP and community resilience um, has to do with that. So um, we decided that it would make sense to try to bring together different different groups from you know the supply chain side, from where we get the materials for um, batteries and electrification to the manufacturing of cars to the environmental side to the to the electricity side to talk about you know what are the what does this you know decarbonization look like? What are our challenges? Uh, with respect to um, the electrification of, of, of uh, professional, but you know, uh, corporate and other sector sides, vehicles as well as personal vehicles, and, and all of those different dimensions. So, as you can see on your table, there's sort of a run of our um, speakers. We want that part of it to go pretty efficiently. So I'm not going to introduce each one. We're going to run it the, the order that it's in. And you are, if you're a speaker, you know, just feel free to come up. We've got the slides um, set up for you to introduce yourself and, and share your hunches. This is the point, is, is the hunches. Um, at the conclusion of that, then we really would encourage you to meet, mingle, talk with people who spoke, talk with people from different sectors who you don't know. While it's delightful to meet the meet and chat with the people you already know, we hope you have a chance also to um, meet with some of the people that you haven't met with before. Um, share emails, business cards, uh, follow up, and uh, you know, we right now this this event is, is dropping a, a stone in the water, and we are looking forward to sort of the ripples uh, that are inevitably going to to follow. Um, also on your table are some of the materials from the Knowledge Exchange for Resilience, including our annual report and the Heat Solutions document that um, the team created, that you are welcome to browse through and you are welcome to take with you. So please feel free to take them with you. If there's more than one person at the table who wants some of those materials, um, you, know, you can contact me and I'll make sure that you get copies of them um, at a different time. So, um, again, I hope you're enjoying your lunch. It looks fabulous. I need about half mine. Um, and I'm really excited to hear what our different, um, our different people say about sort of transportation electrification. So let's get it kicked off. Um, and I think, Mark, you're first one on deck. And if you just want to, again, follow the thing. I'm not going to come up in between every single one. Please to draw a pole position to start off this uh, extremely important dialogue today about transportation electrification. The transportation electrification could very well be the, the biggest societal shift in transportation since the advent of the automobile and the airplane. If it's done correctly, we have the opportunity to unlock a number of societal benefits. Oh, I should probably go to my slide, huh? There we go. Uh, so if it's done correctly, it has an opportunity to unlock a number of extremely broad and important societal benefits. I think there are any number of them that we could talk about, but there are four key ones here that I chose to, to quickly talk about today. The first is, is climate change mitigation and climate justice. And I think this is perhaps the most obvious one of all of these potential benefits to all of us. I think everybody in this room is, is probably well aware that the transportation sector is the largest emitter of greenhouse gas emissions in the United States, followed closely by the utility industry. And so that there's a real opportunity for us to join forces to achieve a number of significant benefits there. And if truly, if we are ever to start to, to bend the trajectory downward toward that one and a half degree uh, Celsius threshold, we need to begin by addressing uh, road transport. So it's a really good opportunity to, to kind of 
couple of those two, um, collectively we can address more than 50% of the nation's greenhouse gas emissions. And we can start to resolve some of the, uh, the, the challenges in the future for the grid, particularly um, with, with bringing on more solar energy, battery storage, uh, if we encourage people to charge at the right time of day. Second one uh, is improved air quality. I'm briefly just going to touch upon this because Joanna is going to do a little bit of a deeper dive into this topic. But um, we all know that uh, greenhouse gas emissions cause air pollution, which disproportionately impact limited income communities. Uh, in addition, Maricopa County continues to be a non-attainment area, so uh, a real big opportunity to, to improve air quality there as well. Um, transportation electrification on the jobs front is a massive economic opportunity. And the transition to electric vehicles is actually forecast to, to create more jobs than it displaces. There could be a net gain of 2 million jobs by 2035 if all new vehicle sales are electric, with tens of thousands of those being um, in the automotive industry. Um, in addition, federal in investments could add 1.3 billion of GDP to the economy uh, and with the, the, uh, lead to an increasing demand in electricity uh, generation and transmission, uh, production of batteries and semiconductors and additional charging stations. And so that could be a significant uh, boom for the nation's economy, but we also know that here at home. In a fast growing area that continues to draw a number of key economic development players, this could be a good opportunity for the state of Arizona. And, and finally, equitable mobility. Um, the uh, limited income um, and, and communities of, uh, of color uh, could actually benefit the most from this transition. It's estimated that limited income communities spend about 30% of their income on transportation and drive vehicles that are 15% less fuel efficient than um, folks with more income because that leads to a higher dollar cost per mile travel. And they tend to drive older stock vehicles which are more likely to break down, potentially uh, threatening their jobs. So there's a, a, a really good uh, opportunity to kind of address some of those. We also know from a customer perspective at SRP that many of our limited income uh, customers tend to live in multiple unit dwellings where they don't have access to easy charging. So that's quite, a, quite enough to crack there. Uh, electric vehicles aren't new. They've, they've been around for some time. Um, they've been around for decades. We just never seem to achieve full liftoff with them. And from our experience, what we've seen is despite the number of entities and industries that have been working on this, they've largely been disparate efforts. What we have not done is address this from a system-wide perspective. So therefore, the hunch is that the beneficial outcomes that I mentioned and more will not happen without intentional coordinated action. And that's why SRP started the Transportation Electrification Activator, which is a coalition of practitioners committed to uh, pursuing common objectives to unlock the full potential of transportation electrification. We can't do it alone. No organization has the, the solution to all of this. So I think the challenge is, is how do we continue to build uh, this organization to advance beyond the foundation, foundational members? And right now, we have seven foundational members. Uh, we, we are working with ASU. The cities of Phoenix, Mesa, and Tempe, the Southwest Energy Efficiency Project, Western Resource Advocates, and Shell Recharge, the, the charging company. So a great opportunity here, but I'd love to hear more from all of you about how do we continue to, to uh, really do this in a conjunctive manner. Thank you. Good afternoon. My name is Amanda Luker, and I work for the Arizona Department of Environmental Quality. I've been a transportation planner in Phoenix for 24 years now. I've worked on light rail, bus, and roadway projects. Um, I'm going to give you a little preview so that you don't get whiplash from the prior presentation and, <laughs> and kind of let you know what I'm going to talk about. I am going to talk about the need for better data quality and different types of data so that we can support on the public sector the efforts that all of you or many of you are working on. So that said, I better get started. I only have five minutes. Okay, when it comes to planning and environmental quality, Jane Jacobs, journalist and urban planning influencer of her time, put it well. There is no logic that can be superimposed on the city. People make it, and it is for them, not buildings, that we must fit our plans. 
I think this is also true for transportation and air quality planning. There is a delicate balance between sustainability and personal behavior. As this audience knows, clean air is essential for Arizona to remain a desirable place to live, work, and play. Vehicle emissions are a significant contributor to our air quality problems. The Phoenix area exceeded federal health standard for ozone over 51 days in 2021. On-road vehicles are responsible for emitting a large percentage of the pollutants that come to combine to form ozone. It is clear that 2020 was a pivotal year, but less clear how it impacted transportation and air quality. As we've seen, ozone, arguably a complex pollutant, remains a significant issue for Arizonans. Regional travel data shows that in general, average weekday traffic volumes in Maricopa County have returned to pre-COVID levels after living in 2020. As transportation and environmental practitioners, are we really prepared to return to 2019 in our most critical data collection, interpretation, and planning? My hunch is that, particularly in the public sector, we need to be prepared to look at travel behavior on a much more complex level. Now that we are in the post-2020 world, now more than ever with fleet electrification, changing workforce behaviors, and expectations for personalized travel experiences emerging at a rapid pace. We have the capacity and the technology, and most importantly, the need to build a much more complex data set to help understand travel behavior. Now, I know that behavioral analysis is, is not new to transportation. A quick web search of behavioral analysis and transportation reveals a wide variety of titles. Everything from passenger behaviors and choice of public transit to consumer preferences and electric vehicles. Given this robust body of research and an impressive amount of data collection already underway, I am optimistic it is not out of our reach to create a richer understanding of current travel behavior in Arizona. To illustrate what I mean about how important it is to look deeply at travel behavior after a period of social change, I recently read a paper written pre-2020 that identified a phenomenon the researchers call the Starbucks effect. Given a rise in options to stop for coffee and food, the number of stops people made on the way to work tripled over a period of six years. On a national level, that could amount to a lot of extra driving. If we aren't already asking this question, and in transportation, you never know, maybe we already are, I think it does need to be asked. Are the new teleworkers of today experiencing their own form of Starbucks effect? And if so, are these short daytime trips cumulatively impacting our air quality? If we find this to be the case, are there measures we can take to encourage trip chaining and general rethinking about traveling when working from home? That is just one example of how this could be beneficial. If my hunch is correct, our air quality could experience some measure of benefit from a more complex data framework for understanding and encouraging sustainable travel behavior in Arizona. We cannot sit back and assume travel has returned back to our patterns in 2019. Jane Jacobs might agree that to solve a problem like air quality, we must first understand and learn to work with the people whose behavior 
and choices we seek to change. Thank you for your talk today. I am an alumni of Salt River Project, class of 2019, even though I started in the 90s. Last 10 years I worked on electric transportation at Salt River Project. Now I'm working for General Motors talking about this and one of my transition reasons is ultimately my hunch is if we don't decarbonize the transportation sector. What's that? You can just advance the slide. Oh, advance the slide, yeah. sorry. Perfect. I didn't actually have a slide. <laughs> if we don't decarbonize the transportation sector and decarbonize the electric sector, nobody's going to be living in Arizona because that is our goal, right? The carbon content in gasoline and we'll always still need petroleum, we'll need petroleum for products. But if we can transition that carbon that we're burning in vehicles to using it for other uses and reducing it, if we can get zero or very low carbon electricity to power those modes of transportation, and I don't necessarily mean they have to be electric vehicles. They can be electric bikes, electric scooters. They can be light rail. They can be electric buses. They can be any form of that level of transportation, including using low carbon electricity to power the hydrogen needed to be created for fuel cell vehicles. There's a lot of opportunities. So that is my hunch, that companies like General Motors, who are spending $35 billion in building new battery factories and new factories to build electric vehicles, that's spending $750 million to put convenient EV charging, not only at big locations where there's DC fast charging, but at smaller locations like multifamily housing, at locations like workplaces, and including that in where we're offering level two stations to our dealerships across the country, 10 of them, to put in their community, not at their dealerships, but at their local churches, at their movie theaters, at their retail, at their restaurants. This way we enable that transition to transportation electrification in a way that's convenient and equitable for everybody. So that is my hunch. I've talked for two, two minutes, so I, I could obviously talk a little more, and we mentioned fleets because fleets are going to be really critical as well. When you think of delivery vans, you think of Federal Express or Amazon. These are the big guys building hundreds of thousands of vehicles. It will be a challenge for the utility sector to meet the demand for electricity to power all those vehicles, but we also have to think about cactus country florists. We have to think about Joe's Plumbing, uh, Parker Electric. Things like that where local companies who have strong sustainability goals who want to drive electric in their delivery vehicles, their light duty vehicles and vans, have the opportunity to do so. Farming implements, farming vehicles, just about every form of transportation you can think of, including mining, is having the opportunity to now move into the electric battery um, engine. And then I guess the last thing I'll leave on is battery technology. And I have a hunch that battery technology is going to continue to change. We talk about the scarcity of possibly lithium or cobalt, rare earth metals, um, and other components that fall into battery manufacturing. And I would say that scientists such as those at ASU and universities across the country and across the world are looking and working with battery manufacturing to reduce the components that are difficult to supply and source. We'll continue to move in this direction, but we're going to keep advancing battery technology. Not only so there's greater battery density, there's less use of rare metals or hard to find metals, but ones that, that last longer, that, that can drive farther. So there's a lot of opportunity there. I will say I was at uh, General Motors and toured the battery factories not the battery factories, the battery labs. This is just the R&D battery lab. It was completely stocked with PhD battery scientists from all over the world working on that next generation battery. And that's the other thing we need to get to a carbon-free society. So, thank you. Hey, everyone. I am not Andrew Vicari. Uh, I'm John Hackman. Actually, Andrew and I worked together for the first time in 1998. I was younger then. Uh, and she, uh, we were both a consulting firm at that time. Uh, she now uh, is a global director of sustainability uh, over at Freeport MacMoran. Uh, she was also traveling the past two weeks and she came back with norovirus. Uh, and so, you're right. Uh, but this uh, topic here around the role of metals and the role of mining related to electrification, I think, is a pretty darn important one. So, I just want to give a little bit of insight into why we think that is so important and kind of what a hunch is for us to consider. Because uh, I think it's relatively easy for us to think about 
uh, buying an electric vehicle, or even maybe powering an electric vehicle through the grid. Uh, but thinking about where those materials come from is, is something else that uh, many of us may not have a lot of uh, experience with, and it's also sometimes nice to forget about the mine, right? The mine sometimes is uh, it's dirty, it's, it's, it's a big hole in the ground, it seems like it lasts for a long time, there's consequences related to mining that we uh, may not fully understand. Uh, the stat that I would leave you guys with here specifically is the projections that I've seen is that in order for us to meet our electrification goals, we will have to have three times as much copper uh, in our economy. Uh, so lithium, obviously, Kathy's talking about different, uh, battery chemistries, also very important. Uh, but copper itself, just the core uh, ability to uh, manage the electrical flows through wires and all the other components, uh, three times as much physical copper. Copper is incredibly important for Arizona. Uh, Arizona, I think, is produces three quarters of all the copper that is produced by the United States. Uh, but that, the whole U.S. maybe produces 100,000 tons, uh, whereas there's maybe 25 million tons that are produced around the world. Uh, so again, that number has to get to 75 million, right? Uh, but Report Mac Moran, one of the largest, if not the largest copper producer, they produce around 4 million tons themselves, most of it around the world, right? Uh, so the hunch that I have uh, is that if we are going to meet the requirements for copper in our new electrified economy, we're going to do so with a much greater degree of responsible mining. The degree of responsibility that we take to implement these increased production uh, of current mines, but also additional mines. There are a lot of additional proposed mines in our state. Uh, and I think most of us are aware of this huge increase that's going on in environmental, social, and governance ratings uh, within financial markets, right? And this is a reflection of all the interests that we have in these topics. Uh, that, those are it's great, it's, it's really a, a helpful trend, but another piece of this hunch is that we will have to have more and more specific frameworks for the sectors that are going to be uh, required to increase that level of responsibility. And I'm gonna raise your eyes up to something called the copper mark. The copper mark is produced by the International Council for Mining and Metals. Uh, it is a reporting framework. Uh, it's got 31 criteria. It's got everything in there you would imagine. It's got stuff like, you know, following the laws and uh, no forced labor, uh, safety, those sorts of things, greenhouse gases, but also really specific things around tailings management and how you're dealing with biodiversity and how you are investing in the communities where you are working. Uh, and the topic that I would, again, really ask us all to think about is the concept of shared value. We all here, in fact, my dad, Long time ago, I said, John, there's only two ways that wealth is made in this uh, world. It's either grown or it's mined. Uh, and everything else is value added. And I think that's right. Uh, it's kind of interesting to think about that, right? Uh, and so we have been living off of a huge uh, uh, amount of benefit from these materials that are mined from the world, uh, but not necessarily sharing it with the communities that are a part of that production. Uh, and if we're going to have to triple our productivity in order to allow for all the benefits that Mark's talking about, uh, we're going to have to do so in a way that brings those communities along with, where those communities are proud of the operations, proud of the performance, not just the economic output, but also the environmental and social benefits associated with that as well. Thanks so much. Hi, everyone. My name is Joanna Strother. I'm the Senior Director of Advocacy for the American Lung Association. Um, the American Lung Association is a 115-year-old organization. Um, and the speakers are only given three to five minutes today, so I have notes to stay on task here. Um, every year, the American Lung Association releases a report called State of the Air, which looks at two of the most dangerous and widespread air pollutants, which are ozone and particle matter. This year's report analyzed the three um, most recent years of US EPA quality assured data, covering 2018, 19, and 20. Arizona faces significant air quality challenges, especially in Phoenix. Our 2022 State of the Air report, Phoenix ranked fifth most polluted in the country for ozone and 11th most polluted for particle pollution spikes. Compared to last year, uh, Phoenix Metro experienced fewer days of unhealthy ozone, so that's good, but we also experienced the highest number of unhealthy spikes ever. <coughs> Breathing in these pollutants can cause asthma attacks, respiratory and cardiovascular harm, including heart attacks and strokes. 
Breathing in particle pollution can also cause lung cancer. Many people experience breathing problems such as chest tightness, coughing, shortness of breath, um, often within hours of exposure. Even healthy adults may experience respiratory symptoms and decreased lung function. While air pollution harms everyone, this also impacts our most um, sensitive groups, which are um, people with lung disease and asthma, like COPD, um, our children, older adults, and pregnant women. The transportation sector, as you heard today, is one of the leading contributors to unhealthy emissions, which is why we need bold investments in zero emission technologies to clean up harmful air and climate pollution. The American Lung Association also put out a new report this March called Zeroing In on Healthy Air. Um, we found that increasing zero emission transportation and shifting to a non-combustion energy grid could yield 15.1 billion in public health benefits and that's just right here in Arizona, if we started between now and the year 2050. We hope to keep public health at the forefront of this conversation, especially for the 84% of Arizona residents living in a community with poor air quality, um, also for our low-income communities and our communities of color who are most impacted. My hunch is that we must act on our climate crisis and clean up our most polluting sectors to protect the health of Arizonans. By advancing to zero emission technologies, we can ensure that we can all breathe cleaner, healthier air. Thank you. All right, hi everyone. Um, I'm Jenny Minot, I'm an assistant professor at ASU School of Sustainability. I do a lot of research on extreme heat and air pollution, and I've really enjoyed the talk so far. And I almost want to rewrite everything I wrote now, but I won't. <laughs> I'll just add to it. So the valley of the sun, uh, it's a dry heat, great. Uh, and that haze, it makes brilliant sunsets, um, but that heat can kill and that haze can choke. Cars also seem to be the transportation must in the valley right now, uh, which also helps us escape these extremes, but not everyone owns a car or has access to a car. Cities are also crucial hubs for deploying lots of climate mitigation and adaptation strategies, greenhouse mitigation. Uh, strategies and simultaneously they're confronting the reality that temperatures are increasing and there's inequitable air pollution exposures and there's this sheer intense complex challenge of tackling the air quality problem which I think Amanda outlined really well at the start of this uh, session today so but as cities try to reduce greenhouse gas intensive activities especially through replacing cars with active transit, so walking to the light rail, walking to the bus stop, biking to work, walking to work, could there be unintended consequences of increasing heat and air pollution exposures to people? Could heat illnesses rise as more people walk, bike, and use the bus or light rail? Could cases of asthma or COPD rise as more people get outside? So my hunch is that all of these initiatives are great, but could also expose people to these dangerous hazards. But most importantly, it could exacerbate the social inequities we already face. Therefore, cities, or lots of people thinking about this challenge, must manage and plan for how resident exposures could change and where. And failure to do so could have unintended consequences for health and justice. So we can ask questions like, what could mapping and planning for all of this look like? What do we know now about who's already using active transit? How long are they walking to that bus stop? How long are they waiting for the bus? And who are these individuals who might otherwise not have other coping capacities to deal with extreme heat? Are they coming from a house that already doesn't have air conditioning and they're doing a 30 minute walk, waiting for 20 minutes at the bus stop and then getting on and then trying to do a full day of work? Where is this happening and how can we invest in those places as we encourage people to get out there and use active transit, buses, light rail, bike, to decrease carbon um, emissions, to decrease air pollution emissions? So can we have more frequent, uh, frequent locations of bus stops? Can we have more data on ridership so we know where to invest in these cooling uh, technologies? in the city? Um, can we invest where there has been so much dis disinvestment already? Making options closer and more convenient and 
using the funds to invest in this infrastructure can go a long way for the most vulnerable. I think about this a lot myself. I bike to work every day and I want to keep doing that. Um, however, I know that when I get to work, I'm going to be able to go into air conditioning. When I get home, I'm going to be able to go into air conditioning. And if it is a poor air quality day or if it is just too darn hot, I'll just take my car. But not everyone has that ability and we need to be thinking about those people who do not have that ability as we try and make these positive changes. So forward thinking around these topics I think can support safer roads, a healthier population, so that we can have more active transit, we can have people exercising more in a safer environment, especially in places that can benefit from it the most. Thank you. Hello. My name is Amanda Gray. I work for the Arizona Petroleum Marketers Association. We're a trade association representing the fuel industry and convenience and gas stations around the state. So this is a, a topic that is on a lot of minds in my industry. Um, and I think the future of transportation unquestionably includes electric vehicles. I think that there's a role to play for many forms of energy. But there needs to be a realization that you can't flip a switch and electrify everything by tomorrow. And changeover of the existing vehicle fleet will take time. And realistically, that's years um, before a substantial percentage of the vehicle fleet can transition to EVs. Um, EV adoption is absolutely going to increase next year. It's going to increase the year after that and the year after that. Uh, we're expecting to see price parity for um, electric vehicles and internal combustion vehicles in the next year or two. And automakers have an increased number of EV options, including SUVs and trucks, which is important. I have three kids, two dogs, one husband, and a partridge in a pear tree that I need to be able to drive around. Um, on the convenience and gas station sector, I think it's important to know that EV chargers installation um, is top of mind. and. Businesses are trying to determine how to make a business case for EV chargers. Um, the first graph on my slide demonstrates uh, in fiscal year 21, according to ADOT, we're still at less than 2% of vehicles registered in the state of Arizona that are any kind of alternative fuel vehicles. That's BEV, uh, PHEV, LNG, CNG, hydrogen, the whole bucket. It's, it's still relatively small growing percentage. Um, another hunch that I have is that uh, biofuels, like renewable diesel, have a role to play in the future of fuels. The categories of vehicles that are hardest to electrify are medium and heavy uh, duty vehicles. There are diversity of vehicle types, uh, customization, specific operating conditions. Uh, you may be aware that in the past two years there have been uh, plans on again, off again for a no sulfur, low carbon gasoline refinery out near Kingman. Uh, that would be built and operated by Nacero Energy Company. But renewable fuel, biofuels um, have a role to play um, because they can be used in traditional vehicles and uh, they can utilize existing infrastructure systems. I think that long-term uh, road conditions will get worse even with the federal infrastructure dollars, um, which is a very big band-aid to the underlying issue that EVs are not paying into road maintenance and construction funds. The Federal Highway Trust Fund is funded almost exclusively through gas and diesel tax. Um, at the state level, it's a mix of fuel tax and vehicle license tax. Um, batteries are heavy. EVs have to pay for maintenance and construction of roads. Most states that have done something to address this have done a, a flat tax. And that doesn't really correspond to the user fee model that gas and diesel tax follow. The more you drive, the more you pay. Um, vehicle miles travel fees align most closely with the user fee model. However, there are uh, privacy concerns and um, it's, it's hard to pay that whole lump sum at once rather than a kind of pay-as-you-go system that gas tax utilizes. My closing thought is that overdependence on any one form of energy has risks and drawbacks. So if you look to Texas during their winter freeze, you look to California during uh, their rolling blackouts in the summer, there are uh, limitations and vulnerabilities to the electric grid. And so in Phoenix, uh, air conditioning is very important to us in the summer. Uh, it's a health and safety issue. 
Um, and so the future of transportation, I think, should in include an all-inclusive approach to energy, even as we look to decarbonize and focus on U.S. energy independence. Thank you. Here we go. So this is what I was planning on talking about. Uh, <laughs> so, uh, I was, t uh, so I've had a chance to work with SRP for many years so in a number of capacities, but uh, uh, specifically through the TE Activator uh, with ALA and others. Uh, 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 I, and so it's been a really a great uh, experience and, and a great opportunity to dig into this space. And uh, there was a time that I was talking at one point and I started talking about a third phase of electrification. Uh, and as I was talking that through, I said to myself, Huh, I wonder what the first two were, because I'm not sure what those were when I said that, and I started counting, I was like, I do think it is the third phase. Uh, I think right now, we are in, a, in the early steps of the second wave, or second phase of electrification. Uh, and uh, my hunch, which I'm gonna come around to, is that this third wave is coming, and it's actually gonna be a game changer that's important for us all. Uh, I would say the first wave of electrification uh, was really marked by the enthusiast. Uh, people who wanted to electrify for a specific reason, uh, whether it be the actual performance, that gut-churning acceleration, uh, or the novelty, or the fact that you are obviously not just a card-carrying, but a car-carrying uh, member of the environmental club. Uh, you know, those are the things that really drive people in that first wave. Uh, and we all remember the $100,000 little tiny Lotus-looking Tesla Roadster. People are like, really? That's what we're buying here? Uh, this second wave that we're in the early stages uh, in, I think, really is marked by the beginning of the economic business case, the return on investment that's related to that, and that is tied to the cost savings related to an electrical propulsion system. Uh, to me, that was really uh, demarcated by the Nissan LEAF, sorry, Kathy, uh, uh, when the LEAF first came out. Uh, and for a while there, you could get a, a LEAF with a $150 lease. And a lot of people were looking at this saying, huh, I, I think I spend less than that on gas every month. And I can actually have a car, and the car payment is roughly the same as what I'm spending on gas. And people are starting to do the math. People are, are saying, this is something that I can actually uh, think through. My hunch is that there's a third wave coming. Uh, and that is when it's not just the return on investment from a cost perspective, but it's what I think of as return on invested capital, uh, specific to not just cost savings, but also revenue that can come to you from the ownership of that car. Now, uh, if we think about the, all of the shifts that are going on in electrification, uh, uh, and we've been talking a lot, a lot about it today already, uh, we know that that is not the only shift that's going on. There is also a huge revolution happening in the energy grid itself. Uh, the energy grid is shifting from this old, original, one-directional flow, large, uh, fossil fuel generated uh, electricity pushed out into consumption uh, into this everything to everything uh, sort of a, a direction. When people talk about two directional, it's really everywhere to everywhere uh, flow of power. Uh, and we talk a lot about distributed energy resources, DER, and that can be uh, solar panels, it can be uh, utility scale batteries, it can be uh, smart appliances, uh, it can be the electrification of industrial processes. And it can be vehicles. These batteries we're talking about inside of these vehicles are a part of that DER. Now, in the traditional model of utilities, uh, there has been a huge amount of capital that we have all benefited from. It has built the energy grid as we know it already. And we have amortized that capital over time. Uh, that's through our energy rates. Well, the capital is no longer invested by one party. It's not just the utilities. Now, it's, it's not just all of the companies. There's a huge, huge push with, um, amongst all of the companies that we're a part of to green our own energy consumption. Uh, but now it's down to us individuals. We are investing in solar on our rooftops. We're investing in uh, solar batteries within our, our homes. We're investing in vehicles. Uh, and when those vehicles get connected to the grid in a way that is two directional, uh, it's not just electricity that will flow two directions. It's money. Uh, there will be an opportunity for people to make decisions on purchasing that vehicle that is still a core personal decision. I have to have mobility. I have to be able to get from point A to point B. I still want the lifestyle that I want to leave. But now there is cost savings and potential for revenue. And that is going to be a game changer. Now, if you stop and think about that, every car, I mean, uh, Kathy, the, how big is a battery in a, a, 
uh, the electric car, 50 kilowatt hours? 50, uh, 70. 50, 70 kilowatt hours. I think the, in the Cadillac Lyric, which would be the one that I would like, I think it's 100. Uh, yeah. and, and 100 at least gives me a nice round number to think about. Chico, I tell you that it's going to cost me 300 bucks a kilowatt hour for battery storage. Is that roughly right, the utility scale? Somewhere in that range? Maybe 250. Yeah. Right. So that means a utility is making rational decisions, 250 bucks per kilowatt hour, uh, that a person is now deciding to buy a 50 or 100 kilowatt hour battery. So that's $25,000 of investment. Obviously not all that battery is going to be used by the utility, uh, but it is at least potentially available. You scale that up over across maybe 3,000 cars, or sorry, 3 million cars in Arizona, uh, say half of those are electric. And you start seeing the scale of what can happen now from an energy storage perspective that will dramatically enable this electrification. So that's my hunch, is that there is this third wave coming. The imperative is that all these benefits that everybody's talking about, all the uh, things that we want to achieve from electrification, they require collaboration. They require people like us coming together and thinking about this and how each of our individual decisions are going to be uh, kind of affected by this and how we can work together in order to bring about those, again, those, those benefits that Mark mentioned at the very beginning. If we don't coordinate ourselves quickly, if we do not take action now, this is going to just run right past us. The investments will be made uh, and we will perhaps not be oriented to get the sort of benefits that we as a society want. Uh, so, well, my hunch is that that third wave is coming. The flip side of that is that if we don't get our act together and figure out how to work together, we won't get all those benefits. Thanks so much. Well, it looks like I'm closing things out today. Uh, that means I get the rest of the time, right? I get the next 20 minutes to talk again. Um, my name is John Owens. I'm the downtown redevelopment specialist for the city of Chandler. In that job, my day-to-day -day is working to build a walkable urban place in the heart of a suburban city. We've heard a lot of really exciting ideas about the future of transportation, electrification, micro-mobility. Many of the things that we've talked about today are certainly solutions for our carbon future. But one thing I want to bring us back to and where my hunch really comes from is sort of the OG of transportation, right? It's people power, it's walking. Now Jenny mentioned this earlier in a, and took a lot of my talking points, so thank you Jenny. But one of the things that I want to bring to the fore here quite simply is that you know, as a trained urban planner, our land use decisions play a crucial role in how our transportation future plays out, right? So those kinds of walkable urban places that we're encouraging people to go will continue to be in high demand. We're talking about shopping malls like PV Mall or Chris Townley where I live that are being turned into walkable urban places as we go forward. We're talking about urban downtowns throughout the valley. We're talking about places like cul-de-sac that are on transit. But it can't just be those nodes. Our land use has to accommodate the kinds of mix of uses that the rest of the community so certainly wants. That demand is going to continue into the future uh, in, in a really meaningful way. I want to throw a couple of data points at you that support this hypothesis. The first is really that people don't want to drive as much. You know, there was data from 2018 that analyzed the number of 18-year-olds getting their driver's license. I think we've probably all seen this. But it was about 20% lower than 20 odd years earlier, right? So this is a, a population that, this is four years ago, graduating college, maybe they're ASU alums. They're now in the workforce. They don't want to drive. They want to live near stuff. They want to walk. They want to take alternative modes of transportation. The second data point goes back to some of the things we've heard earlier today as well, that people are working from home now, right? This same generation that didn't get their driver's license wants to work from home or will be working from and with that comes really significantly reduced human interaction. I can't find the study, but I remember when I was an undergrad in college, we talked about folks working from home wanting to go to the grocery store more often, just to have that interaction with the checkout clerk, right? Because if you're working remote, you're on Zoom, you just don't get that person-to-person -person experience. But those folks are going to have to do that now more than ever. And we can't have them doing that in a car if we want to reduce our carbon footprint, right? We need to reduce those 15 to 20 percent marginal trips to run to the store to get a candy bar or a Red Bull or something that'll help you get through the day, and turn those into walking trips. So our land use needs to be developed in a certain way to support those kinds of little walks. The last piece of data that I think really supports this is actually 
the market's already doing this. So if you look at neighborhoods that are historic pre-war neighborhoods like Coronado and Central Phoenix, land use value, land values there, home values there are skyrocketing at rates that far exceed what we've seen to date in some of the bigger homes and suburbs on bigger lots. This is a Central Phoenix neighborhood that is near stuff. There's commercial in the neighborhood, there's commercial on the fringes, it's near downtown. But it doesn't have to be near downtowns, it just needs to be near stuff. People want to be near stuff. And so if we consider our land use going forward, if we really want to reduce those car trips altogether, whether it's electric vehicles or petroleum vehicles, we need to consider how our land use interacts with our transportation choices as well. So my hunch going forward is that we'll continue to see a growth in these kinds of walkable urban places because the demand will be there, but cities will need to be responsive to those ideas and those demand patterns in order to actually make that possible. And so it's gonna require us to rethink our land use pretty significantly. Thank you very much. Yeah. So first of all, thank you uh, to all of our speakers uh, for their great hunches. So thank you all uh, for that. Um, some kind of questions. Um, think about and ask, you know, what did you find new? Uh, what do you want to learn a little bit more um, about? Um, what do you think is challenging and what from your sector and your industry do you think that you could contribute to? And of course, think about how this might affect your work. What, you, what might you do differently today or tomorrow and who might you contact um, about what you learned? And, you know, think about what you might want to do more um, and, and differently. Um, and I'm, I'm, I'm drawing a blur on exactly who said it, but it really does require the, an integrated approach. Mark, was it you that kind of said that in the beginning? Kind of had that theme in there. Kind of had that theme. <laughs> that really, it needs to be coordinated, <laughs> coordinated, integrated from the um, industrial sector, the petroleum, the financial sector, the planning sector, um, environmental quality. We really captured many of the different perspectives. Um, probably not all. And even thinking about what are some of the sectors that aren't represented here um, that might offer some kind of contribution. We, we do these regularly on different topics, um, and I assume because you are here, you are on our mailing list, and we invite you to come back to other events that may interest you in the future. Um, it was great to see you, and again, thanks all for being here.